Brought to you by Wikivd.com Bobby Fischer Robert James Fischer was an American chess grandmaster and the 11th world chess champion. Many consider him to be the greatest chess player of all time. In 1972, he captured the World Chess Championship from Boris Spassky of the USSR in a match held in Reykjavik, Iceland, publicized as a Cold War confrontation which attracted more worldwide interest than any chess championship before or since. In 1975 Fischer refused to defend his title when an agreement could not be reached with FIDE the game's international governing body over one of the conditions for the match. This allowed Soviet GM Anatoly Karpov, who had won the qualifying candidate cycle to become the new world champion. By default under FIDE rules, Fischer showed skill at an early age. At age 13 he won A. That became known as the game of the century. Starting at age 14, Fischer played in eight United States championships winning each by at least a one-point margin. At age 15 Fischer became both the youngest grandmaster up to that time and the youngest candidate for the world championship. At age 20 Fischer won the 1963-64 US championship with 11 elevenths, the only perfect score in the history of the tournament. His book My 60 Memorable Games is regarded as a classic work of chess literature. Fischer won the 1970 Interzonal Tournament by a record three and a half point margin, and won 20 consecutive games including two unprecedented 6-0 sweeps in the candidates' matches. In July 1971 he became the first official FIDE number one rated player. After losing his title as world champion Fischer became reclusive and sometimes erratic, disappearing from both competitive chess and the public eye. In 1992 he re-emerged to win an unofficial rematch against Spassky. It was held in Yugoslavia, which was under a United Nations embargo at the time. His participation led to a conflict with the U.S. government which sought income tax on Fischer's match winnings, and ultimately issued a warrant for his arrest. After that he lived his life as an émigré. In 2004, he was arrested in Japan and held for several months for using a passport that had been revoked by the U.S. government. Eventually he was granted an Icelandic passport and citizenship by a special act of the Icelandic Orbing allowing him to live in Iceland until his death in 2008. Fischer made numerous lasting contributions to chess. In the 1990s, he patented a modified chess timing system which added a time increment after each move. Now a standard practice in top tournament and match play, he also invented a new variant of chess named Fischerandom. Early Years Bobby Fischer was born at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago, Illinois on March 9, 1943. His birth certificate listed his father as Hans Gerhard Fischer also known as Gerardo Liebscher, a German biophysicist. His mother Regina Wender Fischer was a U.S. citizen born in Switzerland. Her parents were Polish Jews. Raised in St. Louis, Missouri, Regina became a teacher, registered nurse and later a physician. After graduating from college in her teens, Regina traveled to Germany to visit her brother. It was there she met geneticist and future Nobel Prize winner Hermann Joseph Müller who persuaded her to move to Moscow to study medicine. She enrolled at I.M. Sekhanov First Moscow State Medical University where she met Hans Gerhardt whom she married in November 1933. In 1938 Hans Gerhardt and Regina had a daughter Joan Fischer. The re-emergence of anti-Semitism under Stalin prompted Regina to go with Joan to Paris, where Regina became an English teacher. The threat of a German invasion led her and Joan to go to the United States in 1939. Hans Gerhardt attempted to follow the pair but at that time, his German citizenship barred him from entering the United States. 
Regina, and Hans Gerhardt had separated in Moscow although they did not officially divorce until 1945. At the time of her son's birth Regina was homeless and shuttled to different jobs and schools around the country to support her family. She engaged in political activism and raised both Bobby and Joan as a single parent. In 1949 the family moved to Brooklyn, New York City where she studied for her master's degree in nursing and subsequently began working in that field. Paul Nemeny as Fish's father Sources implying that Paul Nemeny, a Hungarian Jewish mathematician and physicist, and an expert in fluid and applied mechanics, was Fish's biological father were first made public in a 2002 investigation by Peter Nicholas and Clee Benson of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Throughout the 1950s the FBI investigated Regina and her circle for her alleged communist sympathies as well as her previous life in Moscow. FBI files identify Paul Nemeny as Bobby Fischer's biological father, showing that Hans Gerhard Fischer never entered the United States having been refused admission by U.S. immigration officials due to his alleged communist sympathies. Not only were Regina and Nemeny reported to have had an affair in 1942 but Nemeny made monthly child support payments to Regina and paid for Bobby's schooling until his own death in 1952. Nemeny had lodged complaints with social workers saying he was concerned about the way that Regina was raising Bobby, to the point that on at least one occasion Nemeny broke down in tears. Later on Bobby told the Hungarian chess player Zita Raj Sani that Paul Nemeny would sometimes show up at the family's Brooklyn apartment and take him on outings. After Paul Nemeny died in 1952 Regina Fischer wrote a letter to Nemeny's first son Peter, asking if Paul had left money for Bobby in his will. Bobby was sick two days with fever and sore throat and of course a doctor of medicine was out of the question. I don't think Paul would have wanted to leave Bobby this way and would ask you most urgently to let me know if Paul left anything for Bobby. On one occasion, Regina told a social worker that the last time she had ever seen Hans Gerhard Fischer was in 1939, four years before Bobby was born. On another occasion, she told the same social worker she had traveled to Mexico to see Hans Gerhardt in June 1942, and that Bobby was conceived during that meeting. According to Bobby Fish's brother-in-law, Russell Targ, who was married to Bobby's half-sister Joan for 40 years, Regina concealed the fact that Nemeny was Bobby's father because she wanted to avoid the stigma of an out-of-wedlock birth impoverished childhood. In March 1949 six-year-old Bobby and his sister Joan learned how to play chess using the instructions from a set bought at a candy store. When Joan lost interest in chess and Regina did not have time to play it left Fisher to play many of his first games against himself. When the family vacationed at Patchogue, Long Island, New York that summer Bobby found a book of old chess games and studied it intensely. Fisher biographer Frank Brady describes the family's move from Manhattan to Brooklyn in 1950. In the fall of 1950 Regina moved the family out of Manhattan and across the bridge to Brooklyn, where she rented an inexpensive apartment near the intersection of Union and Franklin Streets. It was only temporary, she was trying to get closer to a better neighborhood. Robbed of her medical degree in Russia because of the war she was now determined to acquire a nursing diploma. As soon as she enrolled in the Prospect Heights School of Nursing, the peripatetic Fisher family citizens of nowhere moved once again, its tenth transit in six years, to a $52 a month two-bedroom flat at 560 Lincoln Place in Brooklyn. The family resided in apartment QA small basic but habitable, 
apartment. It was there that Fisher soon became so engrossed in the game that Regina feared he was spending too much time alone. As a result, on November 14, 1950, Regina sent a postcard to the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper seeking to place an ad inquiring whether other children of Bobby's age might be interested in playing chess with him. The paper rejected her ad because no one could figure out how to classify it, but forwarded her inquiry to Herman Helms, the Dean of American Chess, who told her that Master Max Pavey, former Scottish champion, would be giving the simultaneous exhibition on January 17, 1951. Fisher played in the exhibition, although he held on for 15 minutes even drawing a crowd of onlookers he eventually lost to the chess master. One of the spectators was Brooklyn Chess Club president Carmine Negro, an American chess expert of near master strength and an instructor. Negro was so impressed with Fisher's play that he introduced him to the club and began teaching him. Fisher noted of his time with Negro, Mr. Negro was possibly not the best player in the world, but he was a very good teacher. Meeting him was probably a decisive factor in my going ahead. With chess, Negro hosted Fisher's first chess tournament at his home in 1952. In the summer of 1955, Fisher, then 12 years old, joined the Manhattan Chess Club, the strongest chess club in the country. Fisher's relationship with Negro lasted until 1956, when Negro moved away. Mentorship from Lombardy Negro introduced Fisher to future Grandmaster William Lombardy and starting in September 1954. Lombardy began coaching Fisher in private. We spent hours in our sessions simply playing over quality games, said Lombardy. I try to instill in Bobby the secret of my own speedy rise. Eidetic imagery and total immersion. Based on a 1956 game Lombardy played against Povilis Vitonis Lombardy told Fisher, Do not accept draw offers. For an ambitious and talented player accepting a draw is death. To a top result, opponents fear an uncompromising opponent and thus make more mistakes. Act as I advise and do not copy my timidity. Lombardy played a key part in Fisher's becoming world champion. He was Fisher's aide at Port Oroz, where they analyzed Fisher's games. He was Fisher's second in Reykjavik, where he analyzed with Fisher and helped keep Fisher in the match. The Hawthorne Chess Club in June 1956 Fisher began attending the Hawthorne Chess Club based in Master John Jack W. Collins' home. For years it was believed that Collins was Fisher's teacher and coach. Even though Collins stated that he did not teach Fisher, it is now believed that Collins was Fisher's mentor not his teacher or coach. Fisher played thousands of blitz and offhand games with Collins and other strong players studied the books in Collins' large chess library and ate almost as many dinners at Collins' home as his own. Future Grandmaster Arnold Denker was also a mentor to young Bobby, often taking him to watch the New York Rangers play hockey at Madison Square Garden. Bobby enjoyed those treats and never forgot them, the two became lifelong friends. Young Champion in 1956 Fisher experienced a meteoric rise in his playing strength. On the 10th national rating list of the United States Chess Federation, published on May 20, 1956, Fisher's rating was 1726, more than 900 points below top-rated Samuel Reshevsky. In March 1956, the Log Cabin Chess Club of Orange, New Jersey took Fisher on a tour to Cuba, where he gave a 12-board simultaneous exhibition at Havana's Capablanca Chess Club, winning 10 games and drawing two. On this tour the club played a series of matches against other clubs. Fisher played behind international master Norman Whitaker. Whitaker and Fisher were the leading scorers. 
for the club each scoring five and a half points out of seven games. In July 1956 Fischer won the U.S. Junior Chess Championship scoring eight and a half, ten at Philadelphia to become the youngest ever junior champion at age 13. At the 1956 U.S. Open Chess Championship in Oklahoma City he scored eight and a half, twelve to tie for four eighth places, with Arthur Bisguier winning. In the first Canadian Open Chess Championship at Montreal 1956, he scored seven tenths to tie for eight twelfth places with Larry Evans winning. In November, Fisher played in the 1956 Eastern States Open Championship in Washington, D.C., tying for second, with William Lombardy, Nicholas Rossolimo, and Arthur Feuerstein, with Hans Berliner taking first. By a half point, Fisher accepted an invitation to play in the third Lessing J. Rosenwald Trophy Tournament in New York City a premier tournament, limited, to the 12 players considered the best in the country. Although Fisher's rating was not among the top 12 in the country, he received entry by special consideration, playing against top opposition. The 13-year-old Fisher could only score four and a half, 11 tying for a ninth place. Yet he won the, for his immortal game against international master Donald Byrne, in which Fischer sacrificed his queen to unleash an unstoppable attack. Hans K. Mock called it, the game of the century writing, the following game a stunning masterpiece of play performed, by a boy of 13 against a formidable opponent, matches the finest on record in the history of chess prodigies. According to Frank Brady, the game of the century has been talked about, analyzed and admired for more than 50 years, and it will probably be a part of the canon of chess for many years to come. In reflecting on his game a while after it occurred, Bobby was refreshingly modest. I just made the moves I thought were best. I was just lucky. In 1957 Fischer played a two-game match against former world champion Max Ewer at New York, losing one half one and a half. On the USCF's 11th national rating list published on May 5, 1957, Fischer was rated 2,231, over 500 points higher than his rating a year before. This made him the country's youngest ever chess master up to that point. In July, he successfully defended his U.S. junior title, scoring eight and a half, nine at San Francisco. As a result of his strong tournament results, Fish's rating went up to 2,298, making him among the top ten active players in the country. In August, he scored ten twelfths at the U.S. Open Chess Championship in Cleveland winning on tie-breaking points over Arthur Bisguier. This made Fisher the youngest ever U.S. Open champion. He won the New Jersey Open Championship, scoring six and a half, seven. He then defeated the young Filipino master Rodolfo Tancardoso 6-2 in a New York match sponsored by Pepsi Cola. Wins first U.S. title. Based on Fisher's rating and strong results, the USCF invited him to play in the 1957-58 U.S. Championship. The tournament included such luminaries as six-time U.S. champion Samuel Reshevsky, defending U.S. champion Arthur Bisguier and William Lombardy, who in August had won the World Junior Championship, with the only perfect score in the history of the event. Bisguer predicted that Fischer would finish slightly over the center mark. Despite all the predictions to the contrary, Fischer scored eight wins and five draws to win the tournament by a one-point margin with ten and a half, thirteen. Still two months shy of his 15th birthday, Fischer became the youngest ever U.S. champion. Since the championship that year was also the U.S. Zonal Championship, Fischer's victory earned him the title of International Master. Fischer's victory in the U.S. Championship sent his rating up to 2,626, 
making him the second-highest-rated player in the United States behind only Ryshevsky, and qualified him to participate in the 1958 Porto Ros Interzonal, the next step toward challenging the world champion. Grandmaster candidate author Bobby wanted to go to Moscow. At his pleading Regina wrote directly to the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev requesting an invitation for Bobby to participate in the World Youth and Student Festival. The reply, affirmative, came too late for him to go. Regina did not have the money to pay the airfare. But in the following year Fisher was invited onto the game show I've Got a Secret Where Thanks. To Regina's efforts, the producers of the show arranged two round-trip tickets to Russia. Once in Russia, Fischer was invited by the Soviet Union to Moscow, where international master Lev Abramov would serve as a guide to Bobby and his sister Joan. Upon arrival, Fischer immediately demanded that he be taken to the Moscow Central Chess Club, where he played speed chess with two young Soviet masters Evgeny Vasyakov and Alexander Nikitin, winning every game. Chess author V.I. Linda writes about the impression Fischer gave Grandmaster Vladimir Alatorzyev when he played Blitz against the Soviet masters back in 1958 in the Central Chess Club. Vladimir Alatorzyev saw a tall angular 15-year-old youth who in Blitz games crushed almost everyone who crossed his path. Alatorzyev was no exception, losing all three games. He was astonished by the play of the young American Robert Fischer. His fantastic self-confidence, amazing chess erudition and simply brilliant play. On arriving home, Vladimir said in admiration to his wife, this is the future world champion. Fischer demanded to play against Mikhail Botvinnik, the reigning world champion. When told that this was impossible, Fischer asked to play Kareez. Finally T. Grand Petrosian was on a semi-official basis summoned to the club, where he played speed games with Fischer winning the majority. When Bobby discovered that he wasn't going to play any formal games, he went into a not-so-silent rage saying he was fed up with these Russian pigs, which angered the Soviets who saw Fischer as their honored guest. It was then that the Yugoslavian chess officials offered to take in Fischer and Joan as early guests to the interzonal. Fischer took them up on the offer, arriving in Yugoslavia to play two short training matches against masters Dragoljub Janosevic and Milan Machilovic. Fischer drew both games against Janosevic and then defeated Machilovic in Belgrade by two and a half one and a half. The top six finishers in the interzonal would qualify for the candidates' tournament. Most observers doubted that a 15-year-old, with no international experience, could finish among the six qualifiers at the interzonal. But Fischer told journalist Miro Radoisik, I can draw with the Grand Masters, and there are half a dozen in the tournament I reckon to beat. Despite some bumps in the road, and a problematic start, Fischer succeeded in his plan. After a strong finish, he ended up with 12 twentieths to tie for 5 sixth. The Soviet Grandmaster Yuri Verbik observed in the struggle at the board this youth, almost still a child, showed himself to be a full fledged fighter, demonstrating amazing composure, precise calculation, and devilish resourcefulness. I was especially struck not even by his extensive opening knowledge but his striving everywhere to seek new paths. In Fisher's play an enormous talent was noticeable, and in addition one sensed an enormous amount of work on the study of chess. Soviet Grandmaster David Bronstein said of Fisher's time in Portoroz, It was interesting for me to observe Fisher but for a long time I couldn't understand why this 15-year-old boy played chess so well. Fischer became the youngest person ever to qualify for the candidates, and the youngest ever grandmaster at 15 years 6 months 1 day. By then everyone knew we had a genius on our hands. Before the candidates' tournament, 
Fischer won the 1958-59 U.S. Championship. He tied for third in Mar del Plata, a half point behind Ludek Pachmann and Miguel Najdorf. He tied for four-sixth in Santiago behind Ivkov. Pachmann and Hermann Pilnik. At the Zurich International Tournament Spring 1959, Fischer finished a point behind future world champion Mikhail Tal and a half point behind Yugoslavian Grandmaster Svetoza Gligoric. Although Fischer had ended his formal education at age 16, dropping out of Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn, he subsequently taught himself several foreign languages so he could read foreign chess periodicals. According to Latvian chess master Alexander Koblenz, even he and Tal could not match the commitment that Fischer had made to chess. Recalling a conversation from the tournament, Tell me Bobby, Tal continued, What do you think of the playing style of Larissa Volpert? SH is too cautious. But you have another girl, Dimitriva. Her games do appeal to me. Here we were left literally open-mouthed in astonishment. Misha and I have looked at thousands of games, but it never even occurred to us to study the games of our women players. How could we find the time for this? Yet Bobby, it turns out, had found the time. Until late 1959. Fischer had dressed atrociously for a champion appearing at the most august and distinguished national and international events in sweaters and corduroys. A director of the Manhattan Chess Club had once banned Fischer for not being properly accoutred, forcing Denka to intercede to get to him reinstated. Now encouraged by Pal Benko to dress more smartly, Fischer began buying suits from all over the world hand-tailored and made to order. He told journalist Ralph Ginsburg that he had 17 hand-tailored suits, and that all of his shirts and shoes were handmade. At the age of 16, Fischer finished equal fifth out of eight. At the 1959 Candidates Tournament in Bled, Zagreb, Belgrade, Yugoslavia scoring 12 and a half, 28. He was outclassed by tournament winner Tal who won all four of their individual games. That year, Fischer released his first book of collector games, Bobby Fischer's Games of Chess, published by Simon. Drops out of school Fischer's interest in chess became more important than schoolwork to the point that by the time he reached the fourth grade he'd been in and out of six schools. In 1952, Regina got Bobby a scholarship to Brooklyn Community Woodward. Fisher later attended Erasmus Hall High School at the same time as Barbara Streisand and Neil Diamond. In 1959, its student council awarded him a gold medal for his chess achievements. The same year, Fisher dropped out of high school when he turned 16, the earliest he could legally do so. He later explained to Ralph Ginsburg, You don't learn anything in school. When Fisher was 16 his mother moved out of their apartment to pursue medical training. Her friend Joan Rodker who had met Regina when the two were idealistic communists living in Moscow in the 1930s believes that Fisher resented his mother for being mostly absent as a mother a communist activist and an admirer of the Soviet Union and that this led to his hatred for the Soviet Union. In letters to Rodka, Fischer's mother states her desire to pursue her own obsession of training in medicine, and writes that her son would have to live in their Brooklyn apartment without her. It sounds terrible to leave a 16-year-old to his own devices but he is probably happier that way. The apartment was on the edge of Bedford Stuyvesant a neighborhood that had one of the highest homicide and general crime rates in New York City. Despite the alienation from her son Regina in 1960, protested the practices of the American Chess Foundation, and staged a five-hour protest in front of the White House urging President Dwight D. Eisenhower to send an American team to that year's Chess Olympiad and to help support the team financially. U.S. Championships 
Fisher played in eight U.S. championships, winning all of them by at least a one-point margin. His results were, Fisher missed the 1961-62 championship and there was no 1964-65 event. Out of eight U.S. chess championships, Fisher lost only three games. To Edmar Mednis in the 1962-63 event and in consecutive rounds to Samuel Ryshevsky and Robert Byrne in the 1965 championship, culminating in a total score of 74 90 Olympiads. Fischer refused to play in the 1958 Munich Olympiad when his demand to play ahead of Samuel Ryshevsky was rejected. Some sources claim that 15-year-old Fischer was unable to arrange leave from attending high school. Fischer later represented the United States on first board at four men's chess Olympiads, winning two individual silver and one individual bronze medals. Out of four men's chess Olympiads, Fischer scored 40-718 for 49 65 75.4%. In 1966 Fischer narrowly missed the individual gold medal scoring 88.23% to world champion Tigran Petrosian's 88.46% even though he played four games more than Petrosian, faced stiffer opposition, and would have won the gold if he had accepted Florin Georgia's draw offer rather than declining it and suffering his only loss. At the 1962 Varna Olympiad, Fischer predicted that he would defeat Argentinian GM Miguel Najdorf in 25 moves. Fischer actually did it in 24, becoming the only player to beat Najdorf in the tournament. Ironically, Najdorf lost the game whilst employing the very opening variation named after him, the Sicilian. Najdorf Fischer had planned to play for the U.S. at the 1968 Lugano Olympiad but backed out when he saw the poor playing conditions. Both former world champion Tigran Petrosian and Belgian-American international master George Koltanovsky, the leader of the American team, that year felt that Fischer was justified in not participating in the Olympiad. According to Lombardy Fischer's non-participation was due to Ryshevsky's refusal to yield first board. 1960-61 In 1960 Fischer tied for first place with Soviet star Boris Spassky at the Strong Mar del Plata tournament in Argentina winning by a two-point margin scoring 13.5-15. Ahead of David Bronstein, Fischer lost only to Spassky. This was the start of the lifelong friendship. Fischer experienced the only failure in his competitive career at the Buenos Aires tournament, finishing with 8.5, 19 far behind winners Victor Korchnoi and Samuel Ryshevsky with 13 19 According to Larry Evans, Fischer's first sexual experience was with a girl to whom Evans introduced him during the tournament. Pal Benko says that Fischer did horribly in the tournament because he got caught up in women and sex. Afterwards Fischer said he'd never mix women and chess together and kept the promise. Fischer concluded 1960 by winning a small tournament in Reykjavik with four and a half, five, and defeating Klaus Dager in an exhibition game in West Berlin. In 1961, Fischer started a 16-game match with Ryshevsky split between New York and Los Angeles. Ryshevsky, 32 years Fischer's senior was considered the favorite since he had far more match experience and had never lost a set match. After 11 games and a tie score the match ended prematurely due to a scheduling dispute between Fischer and match organizer and sponsor Jacqueline Piatigorsky. Ryshevsky was declared the winner by default and received the winner's share of the prize fund. Fischer was second in a superclass field behind only former world champion Tal at Bled 1961. Yet, Fischer defeated Tal head-to-head -head for the first time in their individual game. 
scored three and a half, four against the Soviet contingent and finished as the only unbeaten player with 13 and a half, 19. 1962, success setback accusations of collusion. Fischer won the 1962 Stockholm Interzonal by a two and a half point margin going undefeated with 17 and a half, 22. He was the first non-Soviet player to win an Interzonal. Since Fide instituted the tournament in 1948, Russian Grandmaster Alexander Katov said of Fischer, I have discussed Fischer's play with Max Ewer and Gideon Stolberg. All of us experienced tournament old-timers were surprised by Fischer's endgame expertise. When a young player is good at attacking or at combinations, this is understandable but a faultless endgame technique at the age of 19 is something rare. I can recall only one other player who at that age was equally skillful at endgames, Vasily Smyslov. Fischer's victory made him a favorite for the candidates' tournament in Curaçao. Yet despite his result in the interzonal, Fischer only finished fourth out of eight with 14 27ths far behind T. Grand Petros in EFIM Geller and Paul Carriz. Tal fell very ill during the tournament and had to withdraw before completion. Fischer, a friend of Tal, was the only contestant who visited him in the hospital. Accuses Soviets of collusion Following his failure in the 1962 candidates, Fischer asserted in an August 20, 1962 Sports Illustrated article entitled The Russians Have Fixed World Chess that three of the five Soviet players had a prearranged agreement to quickly draw their games against each other in order to conserve their energy for playing against Fischer. It is generally thought that this accusation is correct. Fischer stated that he would never again participate in a candidate's tournament since the format combined with the alleged collusion made it impossible for a non-Soviet player to win. Following Fischer's article Fide in late 1962 voted to implement a radical reform of the playoff system replacing the candidates' tournament with a format of one-on-one -on -one knockout matches, the format that Fischer would dominate in 1971. Fischer defeated Bent Larsen in a summer 1962 exhibition game in Copenhagen for Danish TV. Later that year Fischer beat Bogdan Lewa in a team match against Poland in Warsaw. In the 1962-63 U.S. Championship, Fischer experienced his first single-game loss in Round 1. Bisguia was in excellent form and Fischer caught up to him only at the end. Tied at 7-3, the two met in the final round. Bisguia stood well in the middle game but blundered handing Fischer his fifth consecutive U.S. championship. Semi-retirement in the mid-1960s Influenced by ill will over the aborted 1961 match against Ryshevsky, Fischer declined an invitation to play in the 1963 Piatigorsky Cup tournament in Los Angeles, which had a world-class field. He instead played in the Western Open in Bay City, Michigan, which he won with seven and a half, eight. In August-September 1963 Fischer won the New York State Championship at Poughkeepsie with seven-sevenths his first perfect score ahead of Bisguia and Sherwin. In the 1963-64 U.S. Championship Fischer achieved his second perfect score this time against the top-ranked chess players in the country, this tournament became, as they say, the stuff of legend. The fact that Fischer won his sixth U.S. title was no surprise. The way he did it was spectacular. One by one Fischer mowed down the opposition as he cut an 11-0 swathe through the field to demonstrate convincingly to the opposition that he was now in a class by himself. This result brought Fischer heightened fame including a profile in Life magazine. Sports Illustrated diagrammed each of the 11 games in its article, The Amazing Victory Streak of Bobby Fischer, 
Such extensive chess coverage was groundbreaking for the top American sports magazine. His 11-0 win in the 1963 64 championship is the only perfect score in the history of the tournament, and one of about 10 perfect scores in high level chess tournaments ever. David Hooper and Kenneth Whyld called it the most remarkable achievement of this kind. Fisher recalls, motivated by my lopsided result drive, Hans K. Mock congratulated Larry Evans on winning the tournament. And then he congratulated me on winning the exhibition. International master Anthony Seidley recalled his last round encounter with the undefeated Fisher, going into the final game one certainly did not expect to upset Fisher. I hardly knew the opening but played simply and he went along with the scenario opting for a NVB, i.e. knight versus bishop endgame with a minimal edge. In the corridor Evans said to me, good, show him we're not all children. At adjournment side he saw a way to force a draw yet, sealed a different wrong move and lost. Chess publications around the world wrote of the unparalleled achievement. Only Bent Larson, always a Fisher detractor, was unimpressed. Fisher was playing against children. Fisher, eligible as U.S. champion, decided against his participation in the 1964 Amsterdam Interzonal, taking himself out of the 1966 World Championship cycle. Even after Fide changed the format of the eight-player candidates tournament from a round-robin to a series of knockout matches which eliminated the possibility of collusion. Instead, Fisher embarked on a tour of the United States and Canada from February through May, playing a simultaneous exhibition and giving a lecture in each of more than 40 cities. His 94% winning percentage over more than 2,000 games is one of the best ever achieved. Fisher declined an invitation to play for the U.S. in the 1964 Olympiad in Tel Aviv. Successful return Fisher wanted to play in the Capablanca Memorial Tournament Havana in August and September 1965. Since the State Department refused to endorse Fisher's passport as valid for visiting Cuba, he proposed and the tournament officials and players accepted a unique arrangement. Fisher played his moves from a room at the Marshall Chess Club, which were then transmitted by teleprinter to Cuba. Ludek Pakman observed that Fisher was handicapped by the longer playing session resulting from the time wasted in transmitting the moves and that is one reason why he lost to three of his chief rivals. The tournament was an ordeal for Fisher who had two endure eight-hour and sometimes even twelve-hour playing sessions. Despite the handicap, Fisher tied for second through fourth places with 15 21sts behind former world champion Vasily Smyslov whom Fisher defeated in their individual game. The tournament received extensive media coverage. In December the Fisher won his seventh U.S. championship with a score of 8.5-11 despite losing to Robert Byrne and Ryszewski in the eighth and ninth rounds. Fisher also reconciled with Mrs. Piatigorsky accepting an invitation to the very strong second Piatigorsky Cup tournament in Santa Monica. Fisher began disastrously, and after eight rounds was tied for last with three eighths. He then staged the most sensational comeback in the history of Grandmaster Chess, scoring seven eighths in the next eight rounds. In the end, World Chess Championship finalist Boris Spassky edged him out by a half point, scoring eleven and a half, eighteen. To Fisher's 11 18th. Now aged 23, Fisher would win every match a tournament he completed for the rest of his life. Fisher won the U.S. Championship for the eighth and final time, seeding only three draws in March, April, and August. September, Fisher won strong tournaments at Monte Carlo with seven ninths and Scorpio with 13 and a half, 17. In the Philippines, 
Fischer played nine exhibition games against master opponents scoring eight and a half, nine. Withdrawal while leading into zonal. Fischer's win in the 1966-67 U.S. Championship qualified him for the next World Championship cycle. At the 1967 Interzonal held at Seuss, Tunisia, Fischer scored eight and a half points in the first ten games to lead the field. His observance of the Worldwide Church of God's Seventh-day Sabbath was honored by the organizers but deprived Fisher of several rest days which led to a scheduling dispute causing Fisher to forfeit two games in protest and later withdraw eliminating himself from the 1969 World Championship cycle. Communications difficulties with the highly inexperienced local organizers were also a significant factor, since Fisher knew little French and the organizers had very limited English. No one in Tunisian chess had previous experience running an event of this stature. Since Fischer had completed fewer than half of his scheduled games, all of his results were annulled, meaning players who had played Fischer had those games cancelled and the scores nullified from the official tournament record. Second semi-retirement in 1968 Fischer won tournaments at Netanya with 11 and a half, 13 and Vinkovci with 11 thirteenths. By large margins, Fischer then stopped playing for the next 18 months except for a win against Anthony Sidi in a 1969 New York Metropolitan League team match. That year, Fischer released his second book of collector games, My 60 Memorable Games Published by Simon, world champion. In 1970 Fischer began a new effort to become world champion. His dramatic march toward the title made him a household name and made chess front page news. For a time, he won the title in 1972 but forfeited it three years later. Road to the World Championship the 1969 U.S. Championship was also a zonal qualifier with the top three finishes advancing to the interzonal. Fisher, however, had sat out the U.S. Championship because of disagreements about the tournament's format and prize fund. Benko, one of the three qualifiers, agreed to give up his spot in the interzonal in order to give Fisher another shot at the World Championship. When it was suggested to Fischer that Benko was considering the gesture based on a large sum of money to be paid to him, Bobby replied that Benko would not give up his berth for money alone. It was a matter of honor. Lombardy, who was next in line with the right to participate, was queried as to whether he would also step aside. I would like to play, he answered, but Fischer should have the chance. In 1970 and 1971 Fischer dominated his contemporaries, to an extent never seen before or since. Before the interzonal in March and April 1970, the world's best players competed in the USSR versus rest of the world match in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, often referred to as the match of the century. There was much surprise when Fischer decided to participate. Fischer had not played competitive chess for 18 months, and many thought he would never return. Then to general surprise and delight he agreed to participate in the Soviet Union versus the rest of the world in 1970 in Belgrade. With Evans as his second, Fischer flew to Belgrade with the intention of playing board one for the rest of the world. Danish Grandmaster Bent Larsen, however, demanded to play instead of Fischer, even though Fischer had the higher ELO rating. To the surprise of everyone, Fischer agreed, although the USSR team eked out a 20 and a half, 19 and a half victory. On the top four boards, the Soviets managed to win only one game out of a possible 16. Bobby Fischer was the high scorer for his team with a 3-1 score against Petrosian. Fischer left no doubt in anyone's mind that he had put his temporary break 
from the tournament circuit to good use. Petrosian was almost unrecognizable in the first two games and, by the time he had collected himself although pressing his opponent he could do no more, then draw the last two games of the four-game set, after the USSR vs. the rest of the world match. The unofficial World Championship of Lightning Chess was held at Herzog Norvi. The Russians figured on teaching Fischer a lesson and on bringing him down a peg or two. Petrosian and Tal were considered the favorites, but Fischer overwhelmed the super class field. With 1920 seconds far ahead of Tal Korchnoi, Petrosian, and Bronstein, Fischer lost only one game. Fischer crushed such blitz kings as Tal Petrosian and Vasily Smyslov by a clean score. Tal marveled that during the entire tournament he didn't leave a single pawn on prize, while the other players blundered knights and bishops galore. For Lombardy, who had played many blitz games with Fischer, Fischer's four-and-a-half point margin of victory came as a pleasant surprise. In April May 1970, Fischer won at Rove, Zagreb with 13 seventeenths by a two point margin ahead of Gligoric Hort, Korchnoi, Smyslov, and Petrosian. In July August, Fischer crushed the mostly grandmaster field at Buenos Aires, winning by a three and a half point margin, scoring 15 seventeenths. Fischer then played first board for the U.S team in the 19th Chess Olympiad in Sagan where he won an individual silver medal scoring 10 thirteenths, with his only loss being to world champion Boris Spassky. Right after the Olympiad, Fischer defeated Ulf Andersson in an exhibition game for the Swedish newspaper Expressen. Fischer had taken his game to a new level. Fischer won the interzonal with 18 and a half, 23. Far ahead of Larsen EFIM Geller and Robert Hubner with 15 20 thirds. Fischer finished the tournament with seven consecutive wins, setting aside the Seuss interzonal. Fischer's victory gave him a string of eight consecutive first prizes in tournaments. Former world champion Mikhail Botvinnik was not, however, impressed by Fischer's results, stating, Fischer has been declared a genius. I do not agree with this. In order to rightly be declared a genius in chess you have to defeat equal opponents by a big margin. As yet he has not done this. Despite Botvinnik's remarks, Fischer began a miraculous year in the history of chess. In the 1971 candidates' matches, Fischer was set to play against Soviet grandmaster and concert pianist Mark Timonov in the quarterfinals. Their match was to begin in May 1971 in Vancouver, Canada, on the beautiful campus of the University of British Columbia. Analysts and players alike predicted that Fischer would win the candidates but not without a struggle. Tal predicted that Fischer would win five and a half, four and a half against Timonov. Fischer saw himself as the firm favorite in the Timonov match. He was not alone. The non-communist press was of the same mind. Only Timonov insisted that he could win, dismissing Fischer as a mere computer. Timonov had reason to be confident. He was backed by the firm guidance of Botvinnik who had thoroughly analyzed Fischer's record and put together a dossier on him from when he was in talks to play Fischer in a match a couple of years earlier. After Fischer defeated Timonov in the second game of the match, Timonov asked Fischer how he managed to come up with a move 12. N1C3 to which Fischer replied, that the idea was not his, he had come across it in the monograph. By the Soviet master Alexander Nikitin in a footnote, Timonov said of this, it is staggering that I an expert on the Sicilian should have missed this theoretically significant idea by my compatriot, while Fischer had uncovered it in a book in a foreign language, with the score at 4-0. In Fischer's favor the fifth game adjournment was a sight to behold. Schoenberg explains the scene. Timonov came to Vancouver with two seconds both grandmasters. 
Fisher was alone. He thought that the sight of Taimanov and his seconds was the funniest thing he had ever seen. There Taimanov and his seconds would sit. Six hands flying pocket sets waving in the air while variations were being spouted all over the place. And there sat Taimanov with a confused look on his face. Just before resuming play, in the fifth game, the seconds were giving Taimanov some last-minute advice. When poor Taimanov entered the playing room and sat down to confront Fischer, his head was so full of conflicting continuations that he became rattled left to rook on prize and immediately resigned. Fischer beat Taimanov by the score of 6-0. The record books showed that the only comparable achievement to the 6-0 score against Taimanov was Wilhelm Steinitz's 7-0 win against Joseph Henry Blackburn in 1876 in an era of more primitive defensive technique. Who would have imagined that any challenges match would ever have been decided by a perfect score when the participants are all to be ranked among the strongest players in the world? It is difficult to portray to non-chess players the magnitude of such a shutout. A typical result between well-matched players might be say six wins to four with nine draws. Taimanov later recalled when grandmasters play they see the logic of their opponent's moves. One's moves may be so powerful that the other may not be able to stop him. But the plan behind the moves will be clear. Not so with Fischer. His moves did not make sense. Upon losing the final game of the match, Taimanov shrugged his shoulders saying sadly to Fischer, Well I still have my music. As a result of his performance Taimanov was thrown out of the USSR team and forbidden to travel for two years. He was banned from writing articles, was deprived of his monthly stipend, and the authorities prohibited him from performing on the concert platform. The crushing loss virtually ended Taimanov's chess career. Fischer was next scheduled to play against Danish grandmaster Bent Larsen. Spassky predicted a tight struggle. Larsen is a little stronger in spirit before the match. Botvinnik had told a Soviet television audience, it is hard to say how their match will end. But it is clear that such an easy victory as in Vancouver against Taimanov will not be given to Fischer. I think Larsen has unpleasant surprises in store for Fischer, all the more. Since having dealt with Taimanov thus Fischer will want to do just the same to Larsen. And this is impossible. Fischer beat Larsen by the score of 6-0. Robert Byrne writes, To a certain extent I could grasp the Taimanov matches a kind of curiosity almost a freak. A strange chess occurrence that would never occur again. But now I am at a loss for anything whatever to say. So it is out of the question for me to explain how Bobby how anyone could win six games in a row from such a genius of the game as Bent Larsen. Just a year before Larsen had played first board for the rest of the world team ahead of Fischer, and had handed Fischer his only loss at the interzonal. Gary Kasparov later wrote that no player had ever shown a superiority over his rivals comparable to Fischer's incredible 12-0 score in the two matches. Chess statistician Jeff Sonas concludes that the victory over Larsen gave Fischer the highest single-match performance rating ever. On August 8, 1971 while preparing for his last candidates match with former world champion T. Ground Petrosian, Fischer played in the Manhattan Chess Club Rapid Tournament winning with 21 and a half, 22 against a strong field. Despite Fischer's results against Hymanov and Larsen, his upcoming match against Petrosian seemed a daunting task. Nevertheless, the Soviet government was concerned about Fischer. Reporters asked Petrosian whether the match would last the full 12 games. It might be possible that I win it earlier, Petrosian replied and then stated. Fischer's 19 consecutive wins do not impress me. He is a great chess player, but no genius. Petrosian played a strong in the first game gaining the advantage. 
but Fischer eventually won the game after Petrosian faulted. This gave Fischer a run of 20 consecutive wins against the world's top players. A winning streak topped only by Steinitz's 25 straight wins in 1873-1882. Petrosian won the second game finally snapping Fischer's streak. After three consecutive draws, Fischer swept the next four games to win the match 6.5-2.5. Sports Illustrated ran an article on the match, highlighting Fischer's domination of Petrosian as being due to Petrosian's outdated system of preparation. Fischer's recent record raises the distinct possibility that he has a major breakthrough in modern chess theory. His response to Petrosian's elaborately plotted 11th move in the first game is an example. Russian experts had worked on the variation for weeks, yet when it was thrown at Fischer, suddenly he faced its consequences alone and won by applying simple classic principles. Upon completion of the match, Petrosian remarked, After the sixth game, Fischer really did become a genius. I, on the other hand, either had a breakdown or was tired or something else happened. But the last three games were no longer chess. Some experts kept insisting that Petrosian was off form and that he should have had a plus score. At the end of the sixth game, to which Fischer replied, People have been playing against me below strength for 15 years. Fischer's match results befuddled Botvinnik, it is hard to talk about Fischer's matches. Since the time that he has been playing, the miracles have begun. When Petrosian played like Petrosian, Fischer played like a very strong grandmaster, but when Petrosian began making mistakes, Fischer was transformed into a genius. Fischer gained a far higher rating than any player in history up to that time. On the July 1972 FIDE rating list, his ELO rating of 2,785 was 125 points above Spassky's rating of 2,660. His results put him on the cover of Life magazine and allowed him to challenge world champion Boris Spassky whom he had never beaten. World Championship Match Fish's career-long stubbornness about match and tournament conditions was again seen in the run-up to his match with Spassky. Of the possible sites, Fischer's first choice was Belgrade, Yugoslavia, while Spassky's was Reykjavik, Iceland. For a time, it appeared that the dispute would be resolved by splitting the match between the two locations, but that arrangement failed. After that issue was resolved, Fischer refused to appear in Iceland until the prize fund was increased. London financier Jim Slater donated an additional $125,000 bringing the prize fund up to an unprecedented $250,000 and Fisher finally agreed to play. Before and during the match, Fisher paid special attention to his physical training and fitness which was a relatively novel approach for top chess players at that time. He had developed his tennis skills to a good level and played frequently. During off days in Reykjavik, he had also arranged for exclusive use of his hotel's swimming pool. During specified hours and swam for extended periods usually late at night. According to Soviet Grandmaster Nikolai Krogius, Fischer was paying great attention to sport and that he was swimming and even boxing. The match took place in Reykjavik from July to September 1972 and was the first to receive an American broadcast in prime time. Fischer lost the first two games in strange fashion, the first when he played a risky pawn grab in a drawn endgame the second by forfeit when he refused to play the game in a dispute over playing conditions, Fischer would likely have forfeited the entire match but Spassky not wanting to win by default, yielded to Fischer's demands to move the next game to a back room away from the cameras whose presence had upset Fischer. After that game the match was moved back to the stage and proceeded without further serious incident. 
Fischer won seven of the next 19 games losing only one and drawing 11 to win the match 12 and a half 8 and a half and become the 11th world chess champion. The Cold War trappings made the match a media sensation. It was called the match of the century and received front-page media coverage in the United States and around the world. Fischer's win was an American victory in a field that Soviet players had dominated for the previous quarter century. Players closely identified with and subsidized by the Soviet state, Kasparov remarked, Fischer fits ideologically into the context of the Cold War era, alone American genius challenges the Soviet chess machine and defeats it. Dutch Grandmaster Jan Timmen calls Fischer's victory the story of a lonely hero who overcomes an entire empire. Fischer's sister observed, Bobby did all this in a country almost totally without a chess culture. It was as if an Eskimo had cleared a tennis court in the snow and gone on to win the world championship. Upon Fisher's return to New York a Bobby Fisher Day was held. He was offered numerous product endorsement offers worth at least $5 million, all of which he declined. He appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated, with American Olympic swimming champion Mark Spitz. Fisher also made an appearance on a Bob Hope TV special. Membership in the U.S. Chess Federation doubled in 1972 and peaked in 1974, in American chess. These years are commonly referred to as the Fischer boom. Fischer won the Chess Oscar for 1970, 1971 and 1972. This match attracted more worldwide interest than any chess championship before or since. Forfeiture of title Fischer was scheduled to defend his title in 1975 against Anatoly Karpov, who emerged as his challenger. Fischer, who had played no competitive games since his world championship match with Spassky, laid out a proposal for the match in September 1973 in consultation with FIDE official Fred Kramer. He made three principal demands. A FIDE Congress was held in 1974 during the Nice Olympiad. The delegates voted in favor of Fischer's 10-win proposal but rejected his other two proposals and limited the number of games in the match to 36. In response to FIDE's ruling, Fischer sent a cable to Ewer on June 27, 1974, as I made clear in my telegram. To the five delegates the match conditions I proposed were non-negotiable. Mr. Kramer informs me that the rules of the winner being the first player to win 10 games, draws not counting unlimited number of games and if 9 wins to 9 matches drawn, with champion regaining title and prize fund split equally were rejected by the five delegates. By so doing Fight has decided against my participation in the 1975 World Chess Championship. Therefore I resign my FIDE World Chess Championship title. Sincerely Bobby Fischer, the delegates responded by reaffirming their prior decisions, but did not accept Fischer's resignation and requested that he reconsider. Many observers considered Fischer's requested 9-9 clause unfair because it would require the challenger to win by at least two games. Botvinnik called the 9-9 clause and sporting. Korchnoi David Bronstein and Lev Albert considered the 9-9 clause reasonable, due to the continued efforts of U.S. Chess Federation officials a special FIDE Congress was held in March 1975 in Bergen, Netherlands, in which it was accepted that the match should be of unlimited duration. But the 9-9 clause was once again rejected by a narrow margin of 35 votes to 32. FIDE set a deadline of April 1, 1975 for Fischer and Karpov to confirm their participation in the match. No reply was received from Fischer by April 3. Thus, by default Karpov officially became world champion. In his 1991 autobiography, 
Karpov professed regret that the match had not taken place and claimed that the lost opportunity to challenge Fischer held back his own chess development. Karpov met with Fischer several times after 1975 in friendly but ultimately unsuccessful attempts to arrange a match since Karpov would never agree to play to 10. Ryan Carney opined in the Wall Street Journal that Fischer's victory over Spassky in 1972 left him nothing to prove except that perhaps someone could someday beat him, and he was not interested in the risk of losing, and that Fischer's refusal to recognize Piers also allowed his paranoia to flower the world championship he won validated his view of himself as a chess player but it also insulated him from the humanizing influences of the world around him. He descended into what can only be considered a kind of madness. Bronstein felt that Fischer had the right to play the match with Karpov on his own conditions. Korchnoi stated, was Fischer right in demanding that the world title be protected? by a two-point handicap that the challenger would be considered the winner with a 10-8 score, and that the champion would retain his title in the event of a 9-9 draw. Yes, this was quite natural, the champion deserves this not to mention the fact that further play to the first win in the event of an even score would be nothing short of a lottery the winner in. That case could not claim to have won a convincing victory. Soviet Grandmaster Lev Albert felt that the decision to not concede to Fischer's demands rested on Karpov's sober view of what he was capable of. Years later, in his 1992 match against Spassky Fischer said that Karpov refused to play against him under his conditions. Sudden Obscurity after the 1972 World Chess Championship, Fischer did not play a competitive game in public for nearly 20 years. In 1977 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he played three games against the MIT Greenblatt computer program winning them all. He moved to the Los Angeles area and associated with an apocalyptic cult known as the Worldwide Church of God for a time. On May 26, 1981 while walking in Pasadena, Fisher was arrested by a police patrolman allegedly because he matched the description of a man who had just committed a bank robbery in the area. Fisher, who alleged that he was slightly injured during the arrest said that he was held for two days subjected to assault and various types of mistreatment and released on $1,000 bail. Fisher published a 14-page pamphlet detailing his alleged experiences and saying that his arrest had been a frame-up and set-up. In 1981 Fisher stayed at the home of Grandmaster Peter Biataswer over a period of four months. He defeated Biataswer 17 times in a series of speed games. In an interview with Sports Illustrated reporter William Knack Biasis assessed Fisher's play, he was too good. There was no use in playing him. It wasn't interesting. I was getting beaten and it wasn't clear to me why. It wasn't like I made this mistake or that mistake. It was like I was being gradually outplayed from the start. He wasn't taking any time to think. The most depressing thing about it is that I wasn't even getting out of the middle game to an end game. I don't ever remember an end game. He honestly believes there is no one for him to play no one worthy of him. I played him and I can attest to that. 1992 Spassky Rematch Fischer emerged after 20 years of isolation to play Spassky in A. Revenge match of the 20th century in 1992. This match took place in Sveti Stephen and Belgrade, Yugoslavia in spite of a United Nations embargo that included sanctions on commercial activities. Fischer demanded that the organizers build a match as the World Chess Championship. Although Garry Kasparov was the recognized FIDE World Champion, Fischer insisted he was still the true world champion and that 
For all the games in the FIDE sanctioned World Championship matches involving Karpov, Korchnoi, and Kasparov, the outcomes had been prearranged. The purse for the rematch was $5 million, with $3.35 million of the purse to go to the winner. According to Grandmaster Andrew Saltes, the match games were of a fairly high quality particularly when compared with Kasparov's championship matches of 1993, 1995 and 2004 example. Yet the games also reminded many fans of how out of place Fischer was in 1992. He was still playing the openings of a previous generation. He was moreover, the only strong player in the world who didn't trust computers and wasn't surrounded by seconds and supplicants. Fischer won the match with 10 wins, 5 losses and 15 draws. Kasparov stated, Bobby is playing OK, nothing more. Maybe his strength is 2,600 or 2,650. It wouldn't be close between us. Yasser Sabrewan believed that the match proved that Fischer's playing strength was somewhere in the top 10 in the world. Fischer and Spassky gave 10 press conferences. During the match, Sayrawan attended the match and met with Fischer on several occasions. The two analyzed some match games and had personal discourse. Sayrawan later wrote, After September 23, 1992, I threw most of what I'd ever read about Bobby out of my head. Sheer garbage. Bobby is the most misunderstood misquoted celebrity walking the face of the earth. He added that Fisher was not camera shy, smiled and laughed easily, was a fine wit and wholly enjoyable conversationalist. The U.S. Department of the Treasury warned Fisher before the start of the match that his participation was illegal, that it would violate President George H.W. Bush's imposing United Nations Security Council Resolution 757 sanctions against engaging in economic activities in Yugoslavia. In response, during the first scheduled press conference on September 1 in front of the international press, Fisher spat on the U.S. order saying this is my reply. His violation of the order led U.S. Federal officials to initiate a warrant for his arrest upon completion of the match citing in pertinent part Title 50 U.S.C. Sections 1701, 1702 and 1705 and Executive Order 12810. Prior to the rematch against Spassky, Fischer had won a training match against Svetoza Gligoric in Sveti Stephen with six wins, one loss and three draws. Life as an emigre. After the 1992 match with Spassky Fischer now a fugitive slid back into relative obscurity, taking up residence in Budapest, Hungary and allegedly having a relationship with young Hungarian chess master Zita Raj Sani. Fischer claimed that standard chess was stale and that he now played blitz games of chess variants such as Chess 960. He visited, with the Polga family in Budapest and analyzed many games with Judith ZSU ZSA and Z Sophia Polga. From 2000 to 2002 Fischer lived in Baguio City in the Philippines, residing in the same compound as the Filipina Grandmaster Eugenio Torre a close friend who had acted as his during his 1992 match with Spassky. Torre introduced Fischer to a 22-year-old woman named Marilyn Young. On May 21, 2001 Marilyn Young gave birth to a daughter named Jinky Young. Her mother claimed that Jinky was Fischer's daughter, citing as evidence Jinky's birth and baptismal certificates photographs. A transaction record dated December 4, 2007 of a bank remittance by Fischer to Jinky and Jinky's DNA through her blood samples. On the other hand Magnus Skullhassen, a friend of Fischer's, said that he was certain that Fischer was not the girl's father. On August 17, 2010, it was reported that a DNA test revealed that Jinky Young was not the daughter of Bobby Fischer 
anti-Semitic statements. Fischer made numerous anti-Jewish statements and professed a general hatred for Jews since at least the early 1960s. Jan Heindonner wrote that at the time of Bled 1961 he idolized Hitler and read everything about him that he could lay his hands on. He also championed a brand of anti-Semitism that could only be thought up by a mind completely cut off from reality. Donner took Fischer to a war museum which left a great impression since Fischer is not an evil person and afterwards he was more restrained in his remarks, to me at least. Although Fischer described his mother as Jewish in a 1962 interview, he later denied his Jewish ancestry. In 1984 Fischer denied being a Jew in a letter to the Encyclopedia Judaica insisting that they remove his name and accusing them of fraudulently misrepresenting me to be a Jew, to promote your religion. From the 1980s on, Fisher's comments about Jews were a major theme in his public and private remarks. He openly denied the Holocaust and called the United States a farce controlled by dirty, hook-nosed, circumcised Jew bastards. Between 1999 and 2006, Fisher's primary means of communicating with the public was radio interviews. He participated in at least 34 such broadcasts mostly, with radio stations in the Philippines but also in Hungary, Iceland, Colombia and Russia. In 1999, he gave a radio call in interview to a station in Budapest, Hungary, during which he described himself as the victim of an international Jewish conspiracy. In another radio interview, Fischer said that it became clear to him in 1977, after reading The Secret World Government by Count Sherep Spiridovich, that Jewish agencies were targeting him. Fischer's sudden re-emergence was apparently triggered when some of his belongings which had been stored in a Pasadena, California storage unit were sold by the landlord who claimed it was in response to non-payment of rent. Fisher's library contained anti-Semitic and racist literature such as Mein Kampf, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion and the White Man's Bible and Nature's Eternal Religion, by Ben Klassen, founder of the World Church of the Creator. A notebook written by Fisher contains sentiments such as August 24, 99 Death to the Jews. Just kill the motherfuckers, and December 13, 99 it's time to start randomly killing Jews. Despite his views, Fischer remained on good terms with Jewish chess players. Anti-American and anti-Israel statements Shortly after midnight on September 12, 2001 Philippines local time Fischer was interviewed live by Pablo Mercado on the Baguio City station of the Bombo radio network. Fisher stated that he was happy that the airliner attacks had happened, while expressing his view on U.S. and Israeli foreign policy saying, I applaud the act. Look, nobody gets that the U.S. and Israel have been slaughtering the Palestinians for years. He also said the horrible behavior that the U.S. is committing all over the world. This just shows you that what goes around comes around even for the United States. Fisher also referenced the movie Seven Days in May and said he hoped for a military coup d'etat in the U.S. I hope the country will be taken over by the military. They'll close down all the synagogues, arrest all the Jews execute hundreds of thousands of Jewish ringleaders. In response to Fischer's statements about 9-11, the U.S. Chess Federation passed a motion to cancel his right to membership in the organization. Fischer's right to become a member was reinstated in 2007. Detention in Japan Fischer lived for a time in Japan. On July 13, 2004, acting in response to a letter from U.S. officials, Japanese immigration authorities arrested him at Narita International Airport near Tokyo. 
for allegedly using a revoked U.S. passport while trying to board a Japan Airlines flight to Ninoy Aquino International Airport in Manila, Philippines. Fisher resisted arrest and claimed to have sustained bruises, cuts, and a broken tooth in the process. At the time, Fisher had a passport that, according to U.S. officials, had been revoked in November 2003 due to his outstanding arrest warrant for the Yugoslavia sanctions violation. Despite the outstanding arrest warrant in the U.S., Fisher said that he believed the passport was still valid. The authorities held Fisher at a custody center for 16 days before transferring him to another facility. Fisher claimed that his cell was windowless and he had not seen the light of day during that period, and that the staff had ignored his complaints about constant tobacco smoke in his cell. Tokyo-based Canadian journalist and consultant John Bosnich set up the committee to free Bobby Fischer after meeting Fischer at Narita Airport and offering to assist him. Boris Spassky wrote a letter to U.S. President George W. Bush asking for mercy charity and, if that was not possible to put him in the same cell with Bobby Fischer and to give them a chair set. It was reported that Fischer and Miyoko Watai the president of the Japanese Chess Association wanted to become legally married. Fischer applied for German citizenship on the grounds that his father was German. Fischer stated that he wanted to renounce his U.S. citizenship and appealed to U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell to help him do so though to no effect. Japan's Justice Minister rejected Fischer's request for asylum and ordered his deportation. Asylum in Iceland Seeking ways to evade deportation to the United States Fisher wrote a letter to the government of Iceland in early January 2005 requesting Icelandic citizenship. Sympathetic to Fisher's plight but reluctant to grant him the full benefits of citizenship, Icelandic authorities granted him an alien's passport. When this proved insufficient, for the Japanese authorities the Alding at the behest of William Lombardy agreed unanimously to grant Fisher full citizenship in late March for humanitarian reasons, as they felt he was being unjustly treated by the US and Japanese governments, and also in recognition of his 1972 match which had put Iceland on the map. After arriving in Reykjavik Fisher gave a press conference. He lived a reclusive life in Iceland, avoiding entrepreneurs and others who approached him with various proposals. Fisher moved into an apartment in the same building as his close friend and spokesman, Gartha Sverison. Gartha's wife Kristen Thor Aronsdottir was a nurse, and later looked after Fisher as a terminally ill patient. Gartha's two children, especially his son, were very close to Fisher. Fisher also developed a friendship with Magnus Skullason, a psychiatrist and chess player who later recalled long discussions with him on a wide variety of subjects. On December 10, 2006, Fisher telephoned an Icelandic television station and pointed out a winning combination missed by the players and commentators. In 2005 some of Fisher's belongings were auctioned on eBay. Fisher claimed in 2006 that those belongings were worth millions of US dollars. Personal life Fisher was eccentric. He made a large number of demands for the playing conditions. At his 1972 World Championship match with Spassky, he became more erratic in his years after losing his world championship title. Religious affiliation Although Fisher's mother was Jewish, Fisher disavowed having Jewish roots. In an interview in the January 1962 issue of Harper's, Fisher was quoted as saying, I read a book lately by Nietzsche and he says religion is just to dull the senses of the people. I agree. Fisher associated with the Worldwide Church of God in the mid-1960s. The church prescribed Saturday Sabbath and forbade work on Sabbath, 
According to his friend and colleague Larry Evans in 1968 Fisher felt philosophically that the world was coming to an end and he might as well make some money by publishing my 60 memorable games. Fisher thought that the rapture was coming soon. During the mid-1970s Fisher contributed significant money to the Worldwide Church of God. In 1972 one journalist stated that Fisher is almost as serious about religion as he is about chess, and the champion credited his faith with greatly improving his chess. Yet prophecies by Herbert W. Armstrong went unfulfilled and the church was rocked by revelations of a series of sex scandals involving Garner Ted Armstrong. Fisher eventually left the church in 1977 accusing it of being satanic and vigorously attacking its methods and leadership. Death Estate to Dispute and Exhumation On January 17, 2008 Fisher died at age 64 from renal failure at the Landspitli Hospital in Reykjavik. He originally had a urinary tract blockage, but refused surgery and medication. Magnus Skullasson reported Fisher's response to leg massages. Nothing soothes as much as the human touch. On January 21, Fisher was buried in the small Christian cemetery of Laugardalia Church, outside the town of Selfos, 60 kilometers southeast of Reykjavik, after a Catholic funeral presided over by Fr. Jakob Roland of the Diocese of Reykjavik. In accordance with Fisher's wishes, only Miyoko Watai Garthus Ferrison and Garthus family were present. Fisher's estate was estimated at 140 million Icelandic kroner. It quickly became the object of a legal battle involving claims from four parties, with Miyoko Watai ultimately inheriting what remained of Fisher's estate after government claims. The four parties were Fisher's apparent Japanese wife Miyoko Watai, his alleged Filipino daughter Jinky Young and her mother Marilyn Young, his two American nephews Alexander and Nicholas Targ and their father Russell Targ and the U.S. government. According to a press release issued by Samuel Estimo, an attorney representing Jinky Young, the Supreme Court of Iceland ruled in December 2009 that Watai's claim of marriage to Fisher was invalidated because of her failure to present the original copy of their alleged marriage certificate. On June 16, 2010, the court ruled in favor of a petition on behalf of Jin Ki Young to have Fisher's remains exhumed. The exhumation was performed on July 5, 2010 in the presence of a doctor, a priest, and other officials. A DNA sample was taken and Fisher's body was then reburied. On August 17, 2010, the court announced that based on the DNA sample it was determined that Fisher was not the father of Jinky Young. On March 3, 2011 an Icelandic district court ruled that Miyoko Watai and Fisher had married on September 6, 2004 and that as Fisher's widow and heir, Watai was therefore entitled to inherit Fisher's estate. Fisher's nephews were ordered to pay Watai's legal costs amounting to 6.6 .6 million Icelandic kroner. Speculation on psychological condition While as far as is known Fisher was never formally diagnosed there has been widespread comment and speculation concerning his psychological condition based on his extreme views and unusual behavior. Ruben Fine, psychologist and chess player who met Fisher many times, said that some of Bobby's behavior is so strange, unpredictable, odd, and bizarre that even his most ardent apologists have had a hard time explaining what makes him tick and described him as a troubled human being with obvious personal problems. Valerie Krelove, advisor to Anatoly Karpov and a specialist in the Psychophysiological rehabilitation of sportsmen believed Fisher suffered from schizophrenia. Psychologist Joseph G. Ponterotto from second-hand sources concludes that Bobby did not meet all the necessary criteria to reach diagnoses of schizophrenia. 
or Asperger syndrome. The evidence is stronger for paranoid personality disorder. Magnus Skullasson, a chess player and a psychiatrist and head doctor of SOGN Mental Asylum. For the criminally insane befriended Fisher toward the end of Fisher's life. From Endgame, Fisher's 2011 biography by Frank Brady, Skullasson was not Bobby's psychiatrist as has been implied in the general press nor did he offer Bobby any analysis or psychotherapy. He was at Bobby's bedside as a friend to try to do anything he could for him. Because of his training however he couldn't fail to take note of Bobby's mental condition. He definitely was not schizophrenic Skull Asson said. He had problems, possibly certain childhood traumas that had affected him. He was misunderstood. Underneath I think he was a caring, sensitive person. Opening Theory For most of his career Fisher was predictable in his use of openings and variations of those openings. Despite this seeming disadvantage it was very difficult for opponents to exploit this limitation because Fisher's knowledge of the openings and variations that he used was extensive. As Black, Fisher would usually play the Najdorf Sicilian against 1, e4, and the King's Indian defense against 1, d4 only rarely venturing into the Nimzo Indian Benoni. Grunfeld and Neo Grunfeld, as White Fisher almost exclusively played 1, e4 throughout his career. Fisher was a master of playing with and against the Sicilian defense. The next most common defense against Fischer's 1, e4 was the Karokan defense, against which Fischer had a good record. Fischer's worst record was against the French defense, especially the Winora variation. Fischer maintained that the Winora was unsound, because it exposed Black's kingside and that in his view Black was trading off his good bishop, with 3, bb4 and bxc3. Later on Fisher said, I may yet be forced to admit that the Winora is sound, but I doubt it. The defense is anti-positional and weakens the K-side. Fisher was renowned for his opening preparation and made numerous contributions to chess opening theory. He was one of the foremost experts on the Rai Lopez. A line of the exchange variation is sometimes called the Fisher variation. After he successfully resurrected it at the 1966 Havana Olympiad, Fisher's lifetime score, with the move 5.000 in tournament and match games was 8 wins, 3 draws and no losses. Fisher was a recognized expert in the black side of the Najdorf Sicilian and the King's Indian defense. He used the Grunfeld defense and Neo-Grunfeld defense to win his celebrated games against Donald and Robert Byrne, and play a theoretical novelty in the Grunfeld against reigning world champion Mikhail Botvinnik. Refuting Botvinnik's prepared analysis over the board, in the Nimzo Indian defense, the line beginning with 1, d4, nf6, 2, c4, e6, 3, nc3, bb4, 4, e3, b6, 5, ni2, ba6 was named after him. Fisher established the viability of the so-called poison pawn variation of the Najdorf Sicilian. Dot, this bold queen sortie to snatch a pawn at the expense of development had been considered dubious but Fischer succeeded in proving its soundness. Out of 10 tournament and match games as black in the poison pawn Fischer scored 70% winning 5 drawing 4 and losing only 1, the 11th game of his 1972 match against Spassky. Following Fischer's use, the poisoned pawn variation became a respected line utilized by many of the world's leading players. Fisher's 10, f5 in this line against efim Geller quickly became the main line of the poisoned pawn. On the white side of the Sicilian, Fisher made advances to the theory of the line beginning 1, e4, c5, 2, nf3, d6, 3, d4, cx, d4, 4, nx, d4, nf6, 5, nc3, a6, 6, bc4. 
which has sometimes been named after him. In 1961 prompted by a loss the year before to Spassky, Fisher wrote an article entitled A to the King's Gambit for the first issue of the American Chess Quarterly in which he stated in my opinion the King's Gambit is busted. It loses by force. Fisher recommended 1, e4, e5, 2, f4, ex, f4, 3, nf3, d6, which has since become known as the Fisher defense as a refutation to the King's Gambit. Fisher later played the King's Gambit as white in three tournament games winning them all. Endgame Fisher had excellent endgame technique. International master Jeremy Silman listed him as one of the five best endgame players, calling Fisher a master of bishop endings. The endgame of a rook bishop and pawns against a rook knight and pawns has sometimes been called the Fisher endgame because of several instructive wins by Fisher including three against Mark Timonov in 1970 and 1971. Fischer Clock In 1988 Fischer filed for four or a new type of chess clock which gave each player a fixed period at the start of the game and then added a small increment after each completed move. Used in the 1992 rematch between Fischer and Spassky the Fischer clock soon became standard in most major chess tournaments. Fischer Random Chess Fischer heavily disparaged chess as it was currently being played. As a result, on June 19, 1996, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Fischer announced and advocated a variant of chess called Fischer Random Chess. The goal of Fischer Random Chess was to ensure that a game between two players is a contest between their understandings of chess rather than their abilities to memorize opening lines or prepare opening strategies. In a 2006 Icelandic radio interview, Fischer explained his reasons for advocating Fisch random chess. In chess so much depends on opening theory. So the champions before the last century did not know as much as I do, and other players do about opening theory. So if you just brought them back, from the dead they wouldn't do well. They'd get bad openings. You cannot compare the playing strength, you can only talk about natural ability. Memorization is enormously powerful. Some kid of 14 today or even younger, could get an opening advantage against Capablanca, and especially against the players of the previous century like Morphe and Steinitz. Maybe they would still be able to outplay the young kid of today. Or maybe not because nowadays, when you get the opening advantage not only do you get the opening advantage you know how to play. They have so many examples of what to do from this position. And that is why I don't like chess anymore. It is all just memorization and prearrangement. Legacy Kasparov calls Fischer perhaps the most mythologically shrouded figure in chess. Some leading players, and some of Fischer's biographers have ranked him as the greatest player who ever lived. Other writers have said that he was arguably the greatest player ever. Without reaching a definitive conclusion, Leonard Barden wrote most experts place him the second or third best ever behind Kasparov but probably ahead of Karpov. Some grandmasters compared Fischer's play to that of a computer, a player without noticeable weaknesses, although international ratings were introduced only in 1970. Chess metrics determined that Fischer's peak rating was 2,895 in October 1971, the highest in history. His one-year peak average was 2,881, the highest of all time. His three-year peak average was 2,867. From January 1971 to December 1973, the second highest ever just behind Garry Kasparov. Fischer was ranked as the number one player in the world for a total of 109 different months. Running from February 1964 until July 1974, 
Fisher's great rival Mikhail Tal praised him as the greatest genius to have descended from the chess heavens. American grandmaster Arthur Bisguier wrote, Robert James Fisher is one of the few people in any sphere of endeavor who has been accorded the accolade of being called a legend in his own time. Former world champion T. Graun Petrosian stated that Fischer put more time into chess than the entire Soviet team. Biographers David Edmonds and John Ida now wrote, Faced with Fischer's extraordinary coolness his opponent's sick assurance would begin to disintegrate. A Fischer move which at first glance has looked weak would be reassessed. It must have a deep master plan behind it undetectable by mere mortals. The U.S. Grandmaster Robert Byrne labeled the phenomenon Fisher fear. Grandmasters would wilt. Their suits would crumple sweat would glisten on their brows. Panic would overwhelm their nervous systems. Errors would creep in. Calculations would go awry. There was talk among grandmasters that Fischer hypnotized his opponents, that he undermined their intellectual powers with a dark mystic insidious force. Kasparov wrote that Fischer became the detonator of an avalanche of new chess ideas, a revolutionary whose revolution is still in progress. In January 2009, reigning world champion Vaswanathan Anand described him as the greatest chess player who ever lived. Serbian grandmaster Lubomir Lubayevich called Fischer, a man without frontiers. He didn't divide the East and the West. He brought them together in their admiration of him. German grandmaster Carsten Müller wrote, Fischer, who had taken the highest crown almost single-handedly from the mighty, almost invincible Soviet chess empire shook the whole world not only the chess world to its core, he started a chess boom not only in the United States and in the Western Hemisphere but worldwide. Teaching chess or playing chess as a career had truly become a respectable profession. After Bobby, the game was simply not the same. Fisher was a charter inductee into the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame in Washington, D.C. in 1985. After routing Taimanov, Larson and Petrosian in 1971, Fischer achieved a then-record ELO rating of 2,785. After beating Spassky, by the score 12 and a half 8 and a half in the 1972 match his rating dropped to 2,780. St. Louis philanthropist Rex Sinkfield offered a $64,000 Fischer Memorial Prize for any player who could win all nine of their games at the 2009 U.S. Chess Championship. By the fifth day of the championship, all 24 participants became ineligible for the prize, having drawn a lost at least one game. Internet Bobby Fischer Theory In 2001, Nigel Short wrote in the Sunday Telegraph chess column that he believed he had been secretly playing Fischer on the Internet Chess Club in speed chess matches. Fischer denied ownership of the account. National Masters R.O. Mitchell and Lionel Davis both claimed to have played Fischer on ICC, with Mitchell providing his alleged conversation with a supposed Fischer. Chessbase.com did a study where they concluded that the user was more likely a hoax and not the real Bobby Fischer under Fisher's name. Numerous books list Fisher as a co-author or endorser. One such book is Bobby Fisher Teaches Chess co-written by Don Mosenfelder and Stuart Margulies. Brought to you by Wikivd.com Would you like to know more?